Nice to be here. Thank you all for having me. And let's get one thing clear right up front. I am not a scientist. <laughs> I am not a botanist. I'm not a zoologist. I'm not a biologist. I am a writer. And as a writer, I'm nosy. I tend to sit in coffee shops and listen to what everybody else is saying. And then I take it home and I write it down. And I steal all your good stuff. <laughs> and you got good stuff. I don't have good stuff, because I'm sitting at home behind the laptop every day. I don't have an exciting life, except when I travel. So my idea is that arts are going to save the world. Writers, painters, musicians, those people are going to help you people, you scientists, to save the world. And I do have proof. About a year ago, actually a couple of years ago, I moved from Roxborough, North Carolina, which is a little town that gets the most snow of any place in the area, to Durham. And when I moved there, my townhome was surrounded by trees. About six months after I moved there, this is what I saw every day. And there was one day when I was walking by with my dog and I thought, wow, there's a lot of trees gone in that 50 acres. And when my grandson was in the car with me about a week later. He pointed and said, wow, Nana, look at all the tractors. Look at the bulldozers. I said, there's no trees. And he says, you know what? I read a book that talked about Beasley, the bird who lived in the tree, and his millions of friends, and how they all disappeared when the tree got taken down. And I thought, yep, that's how this kid learns about science. And you know what? You ask him to do something with you, he wants to build a volcano. Mind you, he's five. He wants to build a volcano because he wants to play science. He wants to do stuff that has something to do with getting your hands into it and learning about it. So my idea, my life's work, has been to let people know what other people are thinking and doing. But I don't think that's enough anymore. I think I have to let them know about the world and about what's happening to the world because we're growing too fast. We're taking out 50 acres of trees and every one of those trees has a million lives that rely on that tree. So my work now has a lot of environmental aspects to it. And it comes from traveling and it comes from being nosy and it comes from sitting and listening to everybody else's conversations and seeing what everybody else is doing in the world. So let me tell you some stories. A couple of years ago, I was in Thailand. <clears throat> and I went there because my mother loved elephants. She had all these tchotchkes. Anybody know what a tchotchke is? <clears throat> it's those totally useless things that everybody gives you, and you have them all over your house. And all they're good for is gathering dust. But my mother loved these elephants because she knew their social structure. She knew that they were part of a family. So when I went to Thailand, I visited an elephant sanctuary in her memory. And while I was there, um, I was standing on the platform. You walk in, it's a huge 900,000 acre place with approximately, there was 24 elephants there at that time, lots of ox, uh, dogs, cats, anything that needed to be rescued was there. And when I was standing on the platform meeting the group of elephants for the first time, there was one old elephant that came up and just kind of connected with me, eye to eye. Come to find out he was blind in one eye. But he was connected. He was definitely connected. We were feeding them. They eat most of the day. I mean, if you kept feeding an elephant, they would keep on eating. So we're feeding them. I had my rings on. Little did I think, it's 100 degrees. It's Thailand. It's moist. You know, it's beyond moist. It's like my body is raining. And this elephant wants the food. So I'm giving him the food. And he takes some of this rotten squash that's kind of going through my fingers. 
and he takes off my ring, which my sister had given to me. And it's about nine feet to the ground. The elephant's about eight feet tall. I was a little bit above him. And he dropped it on the ground. And one of the Mahouts, who's a trainer for the elephants, was next to me, and he's jabbering away. I said, my ring is on the ground. And he's like, don't know what you're saying, lady. I speak Thai. You're English, you know. I don't have a clue. My ring is on the ground. The elephant looks at me, looks at the Mahout. My ring, please, can you get my ring on the ground? The elephant looks at them how it's like, dude, seriously? Picks the ring up with his trunk, brings it back up, and drops it at my feet. I'm like, elephant's smarter than you. <laughs> seriously, elephant's smarter than you are. That elephant, even though he was a male, became Sophie in my novel, The Morning Parade. Sophie was a very abused elephant, and I used her to tell the story of what was going on in these elephants' lives. There's a lot more to elephants' lives that I learned as a result of this visit. And when I came back home, I put a lot of that information into the novel. Since then, I have had people who used to send me, I'm on Facebook, sorry. They used to send me these videos of elephants with a paintbrush. Or, I just went to Thailand or Vietnam or Africa or wherever, and they're on the back of an elephant. Or, doing something silly that elephants don't do. Sorry, elephants don't know how to paint. They are put in crushes, which are boxes, and they're crushed until they behave themselves and do what that person wants them to do. They don't know anything about dancing. When you see an elephant going like this, that's anxiety, folks. That's not dancing to the music. A lot of stuff I learned. And these people who were sending me these videos now know that's not right. And they're passing that word on to somebody else. I'm not taking responsibility for you know, changes in the belief system about what elephants do. But I'm just saying, my novel did that. My art did that. So these guys, I think of dolphins as my spirit animals. And I just love their faces. I love their brains. I love the fact that they have fun. They're sexually active. <laughs> <laughs> these guys, I love. So I went to Hawaii a few years ago. I do a lot of traveling. And I was on the beach <clears throat> on the Big Island, which is the Big Island is Hawaii, watching a, a whale that was breaching over and over and over. I don't know if you know anything about whales, but their flukes are like fingerprints. Every one of them is different. So I could tell that this particular whale had breached and breached and breached so many times. Something was going on. My husband and my friend were out in the water. I had to stay on the beach, long story, but anyways. They were out in the water and they had found a pod of spinner dolphins, just like these guys. And they were swimming with them. So I was paying attention to them, but in the meantime, this whale over here was giving me one hell of a show. Finally, the whale disappeared. And they were still out with the, the pod of dolphins. And all of a sudden, I saw this huge shadow come under them and up to me on the beach. And I'm like, OK, I'm all by myself. Who do I tell that something's coming up? The whale had given birth, pushed the calf up for the first breath of air right in front of me. I'm all by myself. I'm going, hey, woo, woo, see this? Woo, woo. <laughs> they made it into the silver dolphin, my novel about Dolphins who are caught in tuna industry nets and drowned, um, about the families of dolphins, about how they rescue human beings. And then, now, <clears throat> I'm bringing it closer to home. These are red wolves. And the red wolf population in North Carolina is at about 24, maybe, somewhere between 24 and 30. In the late 70s, early 80s, these guys were almost extinct. 
they had been uh, connecting with coyotes and creating interspecies. I think that's the word for it. I told you I'm not a scientist. <laughs> and practically disappeared. So what happened was a bunch of activists took the ones who were still pure red wolves out of the wild into safe places, zoos and so forth. We've got one of them right here in Durham. Just had a, a group of four pups in last spring, I think it was. And they started breeding them so that they would stay alive, basically, not go extinct. And eventually, they put them back into the Alligator River Na Nature Preserve, which is out on the Outer Banks. These guys are almost extinct. And they might be extinct if we don't raise our voices. So I'm taking responsibility for doing another book, and it's called The Art of Rivers. And these guys are going to be my heroes in that one. Now, this story, that little grandson of mine, we went to the Museum of Life and Science in Durham right after the pups were born. And Rye stood at the fence. And red wolves are notoriously shy. They will not come near people or other beings unless they absolutely have to. So dad, the, oh, by the way, red wolves, they mate for life. There are very few species that do that. So it's pretty cool to watch them. Dad was up in the woods. If you've not been to the Museum of Life and Science, you need to go. It's pretty cool. And the pups were down in a den under a, a group of tree roots with Mama in there. And Rise was very upset because he couldn't see the pups. They were on a camera. And he's like, well, how do I know the camera is really in there? <laughs> Five-year-old. Now, this is where I throw in a few statistics. Enough with the stories. That green that you see is plants, and the brown is animals. And basically, that's the level of extinction. So in the 1900s, age of industrialism, how many animals went extinct? A whole bunch. We're talking thousands. <coughs> and when you look at that kind of a statistic, you think, wow, look at that brown uh, basically column there, that's a lot of our earth that has died that's not coming back. We're not talking dinosaurs that got killed by the Ice Age. We're talking about animals and plants that we're killing. We're talking about animals that could exist if we took care of them or if we stopped being so, shall I say, cruel? Those dolphins get caught up in fishermen's nets. Those dolphins are starting to become extinct. In China, the South Asian dolphin, there's less than 2,000 of them. The Yangtze, and by the way, there's dolphins in rivers and lakes and oceans. The Yangtze River dolphin, I haven't seen one in a long, long time. Scientists are figuring this is the first cetacean that has gone extinct. Here's the dolphin population over time. You can see there was about 16,000 in about 1800. Figure that's right about when the whaling industry went into effect. And that fell off very rapidly. And it's continuing to do so. Here's the estimated population of Asian elephants. Now, you can look at each one of these countries and figure out how industrialized they are, how much growth they've had in that country. And according to that growth, where are the elephants? Look at Thailand. Thailand has lost two-thirds of its elephant population in the last decade. Two-thirds. Here's how many animals are left in the wild. And at the bottom of that is Rothschild's giraffe. And Rothschild's giraffe only exists in one portion of Kenya. And they're very uh, tiny population is in danger of becoming extinct. And there are several elephant species that are also in danger of becoming extinct. OK, guys, this is reality. This is what happens. What happens in Thailand, Vietnam, India, parts of Africa, is that the 
land and the water resources are pretty minimal and human beings and animals are fighting for it. So what happens to the human beings is they're figuring, I need to do something to make sure that my family has room to grow, to make sure that I am going to be safe and to, that I have money to put food on the table. That money to put food on the table often comes from this, from taking the ivory tusks off an elephant, cutting them off while the elephant is still alive. This particular massacre uh, was in Burma, I believe, and the, um, the elephants left babies, which is pretty typical. They don't kill the babies. They sometimes take them, but sometimes the babies leave and the, the rest of the herd takes them. And the babies need the socialization of the herd. They fall in, in Africa. I just spoke about water resources. There's no water resources in Africa, so what happens is they build huge wells that go down hundreds of feet. And they're big enough, probably less than half of the size of this stage, big enough so that a baby elephant falls down them on a regular basis. There are several uh, sanctuaries in Africa, one of which is uh, run by Dame Daphne Sheldrick, whose husband was part of uh, one of the national reserves when he was alive years and years ago. She now has all of the baby elephants, the orphans, and it's very difficult to keep these babies alive because they have a very specific uh, formula that they can eat. And often they think that they're okay, they think they're healthy, and all of a sudden the next day they're gone. But one of the reasons she gets all of her orphans is because of this and because the babies wander off, they get stuck in wells or they get captured and then they have to be taken to a place that gives them some kind of sanctuary. Now let's talk about red wolves for a second. This is their historical range. If you can see, it's pretty much the East Coast. Now it's pretty much Alligator River National Refuge in Manteo, North Carolina. Quite a difference from this and quite a difference from the hundreds that were on uh, land during the early part of our country to now. Now we have to deal with people who think it's pretty cool to shoot a wolf. Either the wolf is bothering their farm, I understand that, or the wolf has bothered something that, that belongs to them, or they just feel like shooting a wolf for the pelt. The problem is, shoot one, you're shooting half of a pair, which will not mate with somebody else, thus you're pretty much killing that, that wolf's ability to survive, to produce any kind of um, progeny. So my point in all of this is I've told you some stories, I've given you some statistics, I've talked to you about animals. Why do we need to keep them? What is it about a red wolf that is good for our environment? We know that they mate for life, so they can teach us something about relationships. We also know that the red wolf keeps down the rodent population. Everything is balanced. And in my Buddhist perspective, everything is everything, which means we need all the pieces of the puzzle. We need those wolves to take down the population of rats. Otherwise, we're going to be seeing rats in the cornfields much more so than usual. We need the, the elephant population to show us family, family structure. <coughs> Elephants know how to take care of their, not only their babies, but everybody else's. Uh, they know what to do when danger comes. They know how to find water. I mean, it's, it's stuff that we could learn from. And the dolphins, do you know why the dolphins are dying pretty much in the ocean? Not just because of getting caught in nets, but also because our noises are making them change their swimming patterns. You know, so all of this growth isn't necessarily helping us. These animals help us. Now, I have a question for you. I told you some stories, told you about the books that I write. Who's Sophie? How many elephants died in 1900? 
I just made my point. I want to challenge all of the artists, the writers, the photographers, the musicians, the painters, to chronicle what's going on in this earth, to tell the stories, the individual stories of these animals. You just, just can't give us statistics and expect us to care. You've got to take us into the story. You've got to tell us that story about me dropping my ring and having that one elephant pick it up and drop it in front of me. Because that story told you more about that elephant's genius than I could in any other way. What would we do without Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring? She told us all about what we were doing to the rivers, the oceans. What would we do without Marvin Gaye? What's going on? What would we do without the music that we heard earlier today? We need the arts, and I'm here to say, artists are going to save the world. Thank you.